their last voyage is the British cruiser HMS Edinburgh. In eight days' time, she will be sunk in action. Before she sails, a mysterious cargo is lifted onto her deck. 91 heavy wooden boxes are brought aboard and then lowered into the bomb room, deep inside the cruiser. Suddenly, one of them slips from its rope and breaks open. The secret of Edinburgh's cargo is revealed. 450 bars of Russian gold. This is the story of how the gold is recovered. In 1942, the Allied convoys battle their way through the icy waters of the Arctic, bringing vital supplies to the embattled Russians. One of the convoy's escorts is the powerful British cruiser HMS Edinburgh. Weighing 10,000 tons and carrying 800 men, her task is to protect the merchant ships transporting tanks, planes and equipment to the Soviet Union. Some of the Edinburgh's crew members still remember her final dramatic days, especially April the 25th, when as payment for armaments, five and a half tons of Russian gold were loaded aboard. The boxes were covered with ice and snow uh, when it arrived alongside, alongside the starboard side, towed with a steam tug, put along there, and we started getting it up with this derrick and with a spud net, and hoisting it and dropping it here. Uh, because this was the head of the galley, always a full head of steam, was always red hot. The ice and snow started to melt away and uh, running like a, a river of blood with the paint coming from the, from the sten, uh, stenciling on the boxes. And Jeffries, Commander Jeffries came along then and said how we were getting on. I said, there's another hoist to come and then we finished. And I said, but this is a bad omen, you know, sir. He said, why? I said, uh, all this uh, Russian gold uh, running with blood. And he said, oh, I hope you don't think like that. Well, as it happened, three days later, we were gone and the gold was gone with us. Convoy QP-11, led by the Edinburgh, now laden with gold, begins its return journey. But the cruiser, zigzagging ahead on the lookout for ice packs, is hit by a torpedo from a lone German U-boat. I had a cup of tea in my hand, and all of a sudden there was this huge explosion. The table disappeared, my cup of tea disappeared, and the stool disappeared. A huge flash penetrated the mess deck from the door uh, next door where the torpedo had struck. And um, the light went out, and the ship felt as though someone had it in a, a giant hand, tremblingly turning it over to port. I saw them dragging the uh, lads covered in oil fuel uh, from the hatch where they lower the stuff down to the bomb room. I saw them hand to hand coming up that trunk, bringing people out of there, which was coming from the, those that survived on the seat of the Stoker's Mystic, were coming up through that hatch. This first torpedo that hit uh, between the Siemens and Stoker's Mystic and the, underneath the sink bay, uh, put a hole in which must have been as big as a single decker bus. Well, up to then, I thought we'd only been hit by the one torpedo. But um, going aft, I saw that the 50 foot of stern had come completely blown away and the quarter deck had ripped up like a sardine tin and the guns of the um, white turret were actually poking through the deck. Three German destroyers now attack the Edinburgh as she limps back towards Murmansk. But one of the cruiser's guns can still fire and it hits a destroyer, the Hermann Sherman, which sinks. Then a salvo of torpedoes is launched by the Germans. I came up onto the bridge and um, I saw this firing in these ships. Next thing, I saw three torpedoes approaching, and next thing was a big explosion on the port side. A huge column of water came up over the flag deck. So I thought, well, this is my lot now. Fearing she might break in two, her admiral, Stuart Bonham Carter, orders the Edinburgh abandoned. He then commands one of the escorting British destroyers to sink her. One of the destroyers put a torpedo in the... Um boiler room which unlike the honeycombed part of the ship was one huge cavernous uh, compartment and the ship sunk in oh, minutes i would say a minute or two minutes 
she went stern first onto her port side and sunk very, very quickly until just the A turrets were visible. She paused then and then she just disappeared under the sea and she was gone. HMS Edinburgh sank on May the 2nd, 1942, taking with her to the seabed the bodies of 60 men and 450 bars of gold. For 39 years, at the bottom of the Barents Sea, the wreck of the Edinburgh remains undisturbed. Her cargo is now the property of the Russian and British governments. At 800 feet, in some of the cruelest waters of the world, the bullion lies too deep to be salvaged by divers. Nor can the wreck be blasted open by explosives, as the Edinburgh is now an official war grave. Surely, recovering the gold is an impossible dream. But one man believes it can be done. In Keithley, in the heart of England, lives a former diver, Keith Jessop. He's done some salvage work in the past and has heard the stories of the Edinburgh's fabulous cargo. His experience in the North Sea convinces him a salvage is possible, but he must first find out if the stories are true. His researches take him to London's public record office, where he discovers the official records of the Edinburgh's last voyage. The stories are true. Here he finds the Admiral's secret report recording the position where he thought the cruiser had sunk. And his confirmation that the gold was still in the bomb room. Jessup believes that the development of underwater technology to explore for oil has brought the Edinburgh within reach. Well, I've realised for quite a while that uh, now we've pushed the barriers back and we can get divers down around the 1,000 feet mark, that Edinburgh was now readily available if we've put ourselves in a position where we can convince, i.e., the British government, the Russian government, and the Salvage Association that I can put forward the package that's required to get down there with safety, respect the war grave angle, and bring back the cargo I feel that at this point in time, we can do that. When Jessop begins his quest for the Edinburgh, he has little to his name. He will have to win contracts from the Russian and British governments to permit him to salvage the cruiser's cargo. It will be the deepest salvage ever undertaken. It will be extremely difficult and very expensive. So he needs the backing of a consortium to provide the skills, money and equipment to carry out the project. James Ringrose is a former Royal Naval officer who served with Prince Charles. He agrees to bring his diving and surveying experience to the venture. We think that the Edinburgh salvage is possible because of saturation diving techniques. Before this technique was developed, divers could work at great depths but had to spend an enormous amount of time being decompressed and very little got done. With saturation diving, which means divers can live in chambers like this for up to 30 days, Going to work at the depth is just like going to work for you and me, and then we can decompress them afterwards when it's all over, which means you can get a lot done, and that really has opened the door to the Edinburgh salvage. Saturation diving requires specialists. Rick Wharton, the joint owner of an Aberdeen diving company, is approached. What does he think of the idea? I started diving years ago when I was at university as a skin diver solely so that I could gain access to wrecks. So apart from anything else, when someone comes and talks to me about a wreck, I'm interested. And Keith's come with a project to look at a wreck that is a wreck from living memory. That, to me, means that there is reality to it. If we can find it, then there is a chance, albeit a small one, that we'll be able to recover the gold from it. Wharton commits the company, the two W's, to the project. Now it's the job of his partner, Malcolm Williams, to turn a dream into diving reality, to bring together the right people and equipment for the most ambitious salvage operation ever. Deep sea diving systems in many ways resemble the apparatus of space travel. The divers live and work in the totally controlled environment of bell and chamber. They breathe a mixture of helium and oxygen at pressures many times greater than a normal atmosphere. Such systems are sophisticated and expensive. Wharton Williams will be responsible for this part of the operation. The next requirement is a ship, but a diving ship can cost £10,000 a day. The team approached the German shipping company, OSA, and its manager of special projects, Uli Reinecke. 
After a thorough research of the scheme, the Germans agree to supply a ship from their worldwide fleet of 91 vessels. If the venture fails, they will get nothing. Like everyone else involved, OSA comes into the project on the traditional salvage terms. No cure, no pay. So how much is the whole enterprise going to cost? I'd say we could do it for three to four million, of which two or three million would be the basic ship's cost, and around about one million would be the diving cost. But we just don't know enough about it yet. We've got to find the thing first. Jessup has already made one unsuccessful search for the Edinburgh. Supplied with information from Norwegian fishermen whose trawls had been caught in wrecks, and with the Admiral's own record of the cruiser's last position, he had searched an area of the Barents Sea for 42 days in 1979 and found nothing. This time, the consortium turned to a company whose business is marine surveying, Rachel Decker. They become the fourth partner in the venture. Decker's Kip Punch has the job of working out from all the available records the most likely place the cruiser sank. He traces the reported movements of all the ships involved in the Edinburgh's last action. Each position, each sighting of the cruiser, logged all those years ago, is analysed for its likely accuracy. Eventually, Punch focuses on one ship, the British minesweeper, Harrier. He feels her reports are likely to be the most promising starting point for the search and his conclusions match Ringrose's own findings. My view is that, um, that we should put a lot of uh, strength on her reports. Uh, we have reconstructed the, uh, her movements as best we can. We know quite a lot about where Edinburgh never was uh, from her reports. Um, and I think we can now go fairly firm on, on the latitude as well. Yes, yes, I think I agree with that. I think if we plunk firstly for the Harrier's position right. and secondly for the, the fishing vessels and that, this group of right. positions here, I think right. that would be a fair way of... Yes. Kirkenes, northern Norway. In early May 1981, the search for the wreck gets underway. After months of delay, the contracts have been signed. The British government, though sensitive about the war grave issue, is more worried at the possibility of someone pirating the cruiser's cargo, so it has opted for a controlled salvage. Sonar equipment is lowered overboard to scan the ocean floor for any large objects. Uh, bridge steer 096. 096, Roger. Incredibly, on their first sweep, something big is traced out on the sonar chart. Punch's experience tells him it must be a wreck and a large one. But is it the Edinburgh? Other ships have sunk in these waters, including the German destroyer, the Hermann Sherman. There is only one way to find out. The remote control vehicle, Scorpio, is lowered into the water. It carries a black and white television camera to send back pictures of the wreck from 800 feet down. The team in the control shack scan the monitors. From among the murky images sent back, they are looking for features that will positively identify the Edinburgh like her six-inch guns, a torpedo launcher, a distinctive ship's boat, and, of course, the torpedo hole that helped sink her. Yes, it looks like sand, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, no, it's the side of the hole. Oh. Ah, hang on a minute. This is that, uh, this is along the boat deck area where the uh, tubes are or something, isn't it? That's definitely a uh, sort of stanchion going up or something like that. Try coming left. Ah, there we are.
HMS Belfast, a floating museum moored on the River Thames by Tower Bridge. She is the sister ship of the Edinburgh. It is here that the second phase of the salvage mission begins. The ship can be examined minutely by the diving team picked to make the record-breaking attempt. They are the best in their profession. Divers like Keith Cooper from Liverpool. Diving supervisor and former diver Dave Keane. Dougie Matheson, a diver who has won the Queen's Award for gallantry. They look with special attention at the part of the hull protecting the bomb room. The video pictures have revealed that the torpedo missed it by a few feet. It's armor plating like that they will have to cut through to get to the gold. The responsibility for the salvage itself now falls on another former Royal Navy diver, Michael Stewart. He has been put in charge of the project by Wharton Williams. He has spent months researching every detail of the Edinburgh and the layout of the bomb room. Well, first of all, we've got to establish exactly where we are, which is a matter of measuring up against the plans. The other side of this wall, or should I say in ship jargon, is a bulkhead. This is a bulkhead. There's a fuel tank. And you can go out to the ship's side about 15 feet. And that would be through, in the event of a ship being intact, 15 feet of furnace fuel oil. And we believe that this tank was breached forward, for up that way. And what we've got to do is measure our exact cutting position, which is below the armor plate, cut a hole into that tank, and then find what there may be in there. We don't know what's in there. It should be a void, but it might not be. And once we've cleared away whatever's the other side of the ship's side, come up against this wall and cut in this area. The reason we want to cut in this area is because up to about uh, slightly above waist level, according to the plans, there is a bomb rack, and that bomb rack could well still have the bombs stowed in it. Uh, I think we should think seriously, Mike. Much of the preparatory work of this part of the operation is shared by OSA's representative, John Clark. He and Stuart confirm their ideal choice for the diving ship, the Stefani term. She is on contract to another diving company and can only be spared for seven weeks. There will be a frustrating delay before she is released. At last, at the end of August 1981, the Stefani term is ready for loading at Peterhead in Scotland. The gas containers are lifted aboard. They take up most room. The ship will carry nearly a million and a half cubic feet of gas, worth around 100,000 pounds. The economics of this expedition are staggering. It will cost about two million pounds. Two Ws have cleverly spread the risk. Companies have supplied specialist equipment or services at their own expense, gambling on a six to one return if the venture succeeds. The payoff could be spectacular. At current prices, the gold is worth 45 million pounds. If successful, the consortium share will be 20 million. The two governments get the remainder, two bars to the Russians, one to the British. In charge of the loading, as he will be of the day-to-day -day diving operation, is another ex-Royal Navy man, Michael Mira. But the team is international. Some of the divers have flown in from as far away as Southern Africa or Australia. They explain their reasons. It's the climax of 13 years in the diving industry and the privilege to be invited onto this job. Well, it's just marvellous, isn't it, really? I guess when I have kids, I'll be able to tell them about it, won't I? You know, and it's, it's the dive of them all. That's the way I regard this one. It doesn't actually scare me. Of course, we all have a great respect for the risks involved. And, uh, you know, you do tend to get blasé about things if, and then the accidents can occur. As uh, I said earlier, we had, uh, was involved with the wreck of the Wahini and um, very near the end of the wreck, well, that's when we had an explosion and one of my colleagues was killed there. On August the 28th, the Stefani term sails for the Barents Sea. Along for the voyage are some rather special passengers. David Keogh from the Ministry of Defence will be representing the British government to ensure that the mission is carried out properly. Looking after the Russians' claim in the gold are Leonid Melodinsky from Leningrad and Igor Ilin from Moscow. Keith Jessup, head of the consortium, is on board, of course. But it is on men like Mike Stewart 
that the success or failure of Jessop's dream will depend. The German skipper, Ronnie Gertz, has responsibility for the ship and its crew. The ship sails northwards to the Arctic Circle, past the coast of Norway, on its five-day journey to the salvage location. The divers start getting accustomed to their new equipment. At a depth of 800 feet, they will be breathing a mixture of helium and oxygen 23 times denser than air. That requires a lot of gas. So they will be trying out a brand new gas recovery unit on their helmets. It's the invention of American Don Rodocker. It's designed to retain and recycle the gas that normally escapes from the helmet. If it works, it will increase considerably the time the salvage team can stay on the wreck. But the divers need reassuring that it will work. If the gas supply should fail, the diver has an emergency cylinder on his back. It gives him four minutes to get back to the bell, or at that depth, eight breaths. <laughs> the time is approaching when the first eight divers will go into compression. <laughs> they enjoy their last few moments of fresh air, freedom and normal atmosphere. Soon they will be sealed off from the world for three or even four weeks. Their bodies will be saturated with gas and put under a pressure 23 times greater than normal. <laughs> Once these divers are pressed down, it will take seven days to decompress them. If anything should go wrong, that's seven days away from help and safety. <laughs> What's life in a compression chamber like? When we actually first go into saturation, you, you don't actually feel any physical difference at all. There's no illness or short stiffness or anything like that. But you, you do become tired more than anything a lot of the time. You, you try and relax, you know, because you are a little bit on edge with, you know, having to dive. There is a, I say an enclosed feeling, the squeaky voice syndrome that everyone knows about when you breathe helium you tend to talk a bit da -da -da -da. hello outside how are you um to anyone on the outside um it sounds quite weird but it's uh, surprisingly enough after a few minutes in there how everyone inside acclimatizes straight away and you can all understand each other's conversation quite plain the ship arrives on location its dynamic positioning system is engaged a computer on the bridge, fed with information from sensors about wind, current and position, operates powerful thrusters on the hull. These automatically adjust the ship's position to keep it constantly in the same place. It is vital equipment. A sudden move by the ship could sever a diver's umbilical as he works inside the wreck. The first dive is about to start. Bell run number one. Inside the bell, Dougie Matheson, who will soon himself be in compression, sorts out the life-supporting umbilicals. 200 feet long, each supplies the diver with gas, communications and hot water. Cold is one of the dangers the diver faces. Without heat, he would be unconscious in about eight minutes. On September the 3rd, the diving bell begins its first descent. On this run, there are three divers in the bell, Banjo West, John Diamond, and Brian Cutler. But this proves one too many for safety. After this dive, only two will share the bell at a time. The bell is lowered from the moon pool inside the ship. It takes 20 minutes for the bell to make the 800-foot descent to a position close to the sunken cruiser. Then, as one diver remains in the bell, the other drops out of the bottom and goes down to the wreck. His first job is to make sure he is in the right place. He will have to survey the hull 
identify particular features and take measurements. He will send back video pictures for the team in the control room to analyze. But first the diver and his colleagues must come to terms with working in the awesome wreck in front of them. It's not easy to convey to men 800 feet above the size and menace of a site like this. Just on top of the armour plate, is that the edge we could see? Ah, Roger, Roger, that's the edge of the armour plate, Mike. You know what it is. You're looking at the bottom there or something on the wreck there. Call it yeah. Derek, bring it up two feet. Struck there, yeah. When I first left the dam and saw the wreck, it's actually amazing because it's so in, I know it's going to sound ridiculous, it's so in one piece, apart from the torpedo hole, from the side that we could see, that it was actually just like a ship on the surface, but in the water. I mean, it's in really good condition. When each diver has completed a four-hour stint on the wreck, the bell is raised back into the ship, and the next two divers will start their shift. From now on, round the clock, for more than four weeks, the bell runs will continue. Only bad weather or an accident will stop the work. The survey has revealed the hard task ahead. It's going to take a long time to cut a way through the hull, in poor visibility, past the tangled wreckage and debris caused by the torpedo explosion, into the bomb room. Even if they succeed in forcing a way in, no one can be sure the gold will still be there. Throughout the operation, the ship is under surveillance from the Soviet Union. The salvage team is working just a few hours steaming from one of Russia's most important naval bases. With bullion worth 45 million pounds at stake, Someone could try and hijack the defenseless Stefaniter. The Russians are taking no chances. A Soviet ship is always nearby, watching and waiting, but not fraternizing. Not even Igor Ilin, one of the Russians from the Stefaniter, can persuade his colleagues to welcome a boarding party. As the days pass, life in the sealed compression chambers has its own routine. While two divers work below, the remainder relax or sleep. For men like Jeff Rudevi, Peter Summers, Jim Tucker and their colleagues, it is a life of tedium punctuated by hard and hazardous physical labor. Particularly on a job like this where you're working all the time and it, it's push, push, push all the time. You're pushing yourselves, you're pushing the other divers to try and get the job done because of the limited time we had, then you are tired and you do sleep, you know, and uh, when you sleep in the time just passes because you literally you're away for 10 hours. And during those 10 hours, you're working. The, the longest time, I think, is when you sat in the bow by yourself and you're just holding the umbilical while the other diver's out for four hours. The diver's task is to cut a large square out of the cruiser's hull. When this is done, the diver will be faced by a compartment situated immediately above the bomb room. This was once a fuel tank, but its oil has long since gone. Now in its place, the divers will find a vast amount of debris, sediment and wrecked machinery that has fallen in from the surrounding compartments. All this has to be systematically cleared before the diver can reach the bottom.
So the cutting begins. Burning at depth with a thermal cutting torch calls for great skill. The gas can blow back and knock the diver unconscious. The wreck is also littered with ammunition. The visibility is often poor. A flame in the wrong place could result in a fatal explosion. Above, in the ship's office, the progress of cutting is meticulously charted on a diagram of the hull. The underwater camera confirms the diver's handiwork. At last, the first piece of the Edinburgh is lifted to the surface. It is one of the sections of armor plating cut from the hull in the darkness 800 feet below. It is treated by the men on the deck as if it was the gold itself. For them, it is the first tangible proof that the wreck lies below them. It is evidence at last that the salvage is making progress. Mixed in with the twisted plates coming up are more intimate relics, like this wooden beam. An encrusted but still recognizable Navy teapot, reminding the salvage team of the life once led aboard the Edinburgh 39 years ago. Sidney Alford, one of the specialists on board, begins restoring the cruiser's naval message pads. Though stained with oil, the paper has survived in seawater while other materials have perished. A week of bell runs continue as the divers struggle to clear the mountain of silt and twisted machinery packed in the fuel tank. It is a hard, relentless slog. Okay, John, yeah, what I want you to do this time is to go out, uh, get to the hole. If the visibility's cleared, I want you to uh, take the video camera in for our Russian colleagues, Roger. Start cutting through the outside of the hull, but into the tank where we found an awful lot of debris in there, which must have come from the uh, compressor room, which is above the uh, tank. There was machinery and pipe work and uh, various other bits and pieces strewn all over the tank, broken wood, etc. We were slinging each piece individually and lifting it out. The one piece that uh, I always remember was the lifting out the, the engine, which I think was the biggest piece that did come out. It was quite spectacular to watch it coming, loomed out of the, the hole. When we do a deep dive, the sensation of working is actually more difficult because you become so short of breath and you do have a problem with your breathing and everything's so much more of an effort. You feel as if you're pushing against everything all the time. I, I don't really know the reason for it, but you do become extremely tired very, very quickly. And the thing is, you don't recover from it. Whereas if you were to go out and do a run, 20 minutes later you'd be recovered from it. But at depth, a great depth like that we were at, then you become short of breath and tired, and then you've just lost it. And that's it. You never regain that for that dive. As the divers near the bomb room, they begin finding quantities of unexploded shells. Some of these have to be brought to the surface and defused by the team on deck. Among the debris lifted aboard, they will also find some human remains, a reminder of the men who died in the cruiser's last battle. For the divers, the immediate hazard is the condition of the ammunition. Obviously, if you cut into a piece of ordnance with a broken rod, then 
you're going to make it go bang. But the thing to do is just to keep an eye on where you were going and what you were doing. Possibly, instead of making a great big long cut, make an observation port and then feel around for these things, because there was quite a lot of it down there. Obviously, we were breaking into a bomb room where they um, kept this sort of material. It is two and a half weeks into the mission. A doctor has been sent for. Four divers have fallen sick. While they are being decompressed, Dr. Michael Childs has made the long journey by plane and boat from Aberdeen in Scotland. Meanwhile, two more divers have been pressed down to join the four divers still working. You'll be OK. She's a very stable ship. The divers are suffering from an ear infection called pyre. It occurs in pressure chambers, spreads quickly, and is very painful. By now, the divers below have cleared away the debris from the fuel tank. At their feet, they should find only a metal wall between them and the bomb room. But the torpedo explosion has bent another metal bulkhead across their path. Their task is to cut a way through both these into the bomb room. Here, once again, they will face a large amount of wreckage and rubbish. But somewhere in the debris should be the boxes of gold they're looking for. Diver Cooper describes what he has seen in the bomb room. Well, I, I went into the bomb room. I was the first one into it. And uh, it was, actually, it was just like a cellar, really. An old cellar full of rubbish and junk and muck because we had to go in there and let the visibility settle down because there's a lot of sediment in the water and if you touched anything then you, the visibility disappeared so literally all i did was go into it find my way into it feel my way into it and then just sit there and let the dust if you like the sediment settle tilt it back down again You're going to show us on the pan and tilt camera. Roger, Roger. He's coming up to the camera with it now, Mike. Suddenly, everyone's hopes are raised by the discovery of a small piece of wood amongst the debris of the bomb room. Roger, Roger. OK. Yeah, I've got a list in front of me of uh, the 93, 93 cases. I've got the registration numbers of all the gold boxes in front of me. And the only one with any twos on is one stroke two two. Mind you, this is only for five tons. This is only for five tons. The piece of wood that has caused the excitement is brought to the surface for examination. It is now nearly three weeks since the team left Scotland. Can this at last be a piece from one of the gold boxes? reports by the divers down there that they have seen box shapes down there in the bomb room. We have had uh, lights lowered through the uh, aperture we cut in the bomb room bulkhead and boxes have been visible but whether there, there are boxes remains to be seen but the next few hours should certainly uh, show one way or the other. Dive 27 of the mission is about to start. Will this dive be the one to strike gold after weeks of effort? Getting ready for another hard day's work is Dougie Matheson from Scotland, who shares this bell run with John Rossier from Zimbabwe. The team is on edge. Will today see the realization of their dreams?
I bet you it's an ammunition box or some bloody thing. The thing that's going to tell us is this binding round it. It's interlaced with copper wire and sealed on the top. Christ, come on. <laughs> He's trembling. Can you hear him breathing? Tell me, tell me for Christ's sake. <laughs> Jesus, what? Never mind, calm down. I've been sitting here for two bloody weeks. <laughs> Christ, you didn't give me a heart attack, man, for Christ's sake. Where was it? Just lying there on its own, eh? Fantastic. You all right, Dougie? <laughs> At 10.48 p.m. on September the 16th, John Rossier has found the first bar of gold. Roger, Roger. I don't know about you, John, but I'm shaking like hell. I can't... Gee, I can't shake it. Say again, John. Yeah, don't worry about the bombs, mate. There it is. Hello. We found it. We found it. Roger, Roger. I'm coming down. I'm coming down. <laughs> Did you the surface. Stand by one, I've got, got a change problem. out the basket. Problem, we've got to make sure we put it in the right container. Okay, coming up, one bar of gold. Gunter, <laughs> come on all the way up, please. All the way up. Roger, very, very carefully. <laughs> Let's go have a look. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Roger, Roger. The first one's the hard one. Sorry, After that. Sorry, <laughs> Very eager to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the cold. <laughs> I hope it is about it. Look at it. No, no. That's good. Yeah. Good. After weeks of continuous work, months of preparation, and years of planning and dreaming. Keith Jessop holds up the first gold bar to be salvaged from the wreck of the Edinburgh. Right. Keith, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull, yeah. yeah, pull that out, that's it. No, leave it out. This way, Keith. Oh. Keith, hold it up again. Yeah. Yeah. This is the right one, Igor. Our Soviet team. Zolota, Moscow. It's OK. It's real. Good stuff. <laughs> the historic gold bar is paraded around the ship like the FA Cup. That's what you're looking for, Hey, fellas, I've got a gold bar to be handy, eh? I tell you what, it's heavy. It looks beautiful. Keith Jessop does not forget the divers sealed off in their compression chambers who cannot come out and join the celebrations. Colonel, this is Keeper. Greyhound Henry, zero, zero, a one. Foxtrot, collar, over. David Keogh, the man from the ministry, tells the consortium back in Britain the good news. For security reasons, the conversation is held in a curious code. Uh, one other message for you. I hope you didn't mind being woken up too early, over. Within hours, divers are finding gold bars like bricks on a building site. 
as the crane hauls up each cage, the men on deck can scarcely believe their eyes. Never before have so few found so much gold so quickly. We need another, um, if we can get another 10 bars, that brings us up to around 5 million, and that'll make it to um, a million quid an hour. Is that okay? Yeah, they're complaining up here because you've only got uh, 4 million in the box. No, I can't repeat that because it's being filmed. Dougie Matheson, the diver from Ullapool, has excelled himself. In his shift on the wreck, he has packed 40 gold bars worth four million pounds into the metal cage. <laughs> For the next two weeks, the gold is extracted from the rubbish in the bomb room, bar by bar. For the divers, it is back-breaking work. The first bar I picked up, that was the one that was worth the most to me. You know, it was uh, a terrific th thrill. Just, it's amazing to pour out of such dirt and uh, oil and grime and everything, and it was still shining. I knew right away when I touched it that it was a, a gold bar. I picked it up and stacked it up onto the shelf, and uh, then went carried on digging about in the muck and found another five. But the very first bar, it was the one that kind of sticks in my mind because after that, it just became like another job. is from Malcolm, Malcolm Williams, and the message is, I quote, have great pleasure in advising John Rothier that he is now the father of a baby boy, John Miller. Mother and baby perfectly well, baby weighs four pounds, ten ounces. Rumour has it the baby appeared with a golden spoon in his mouth. Many congratulations. Regards, Malcolm. <laughs> You're a daddy, sunshine. <laughs> As more gold bars come up, the job of recovering what's left gets harder. Mike O'Meara is concerned about the condition of his divers. My divers are pretty tired at the moment. I've got six working divers left out of the uh, out of potential of eight at the moment. Uh, we had to decompress Dougie with his dislocated shoulder, and Keith Cooper's coming out with him. He's uh, got a, an ear infection, and which leaves six in the chamber, and they're working very hard. Um, we're having to balance the length of the bell runs that they actually do against the amount of time that we can give them off. Um, three of them have been in there since the beginning of the job, which is, we're 21 days into the job now, and we're on dive 42. Um, they're pretty tired now. Coming out of saturation is Keith Cooper with an ear infection, and Dougie Matheson, who, as well as dislocating his shoulder by a fall in the bell, has badly scalded feet. The water had to be very hot to keep you warm, and uh, when it went up two or three degrees, it just went from uh, kind of being nice and comfortable to being scalding hot. And uh, when you get it that hot, you switch it off, and then you become freezing cold within about 30 seconds. And you have to switch it back on to heat the rest of your body up. But when you rest the body is heating up, your uh, feet are getting scalded. Hi, John. Oh, dear. 
Steady, Greg. <laughs> How much is each row worth? 100,000. No, each row. Each one. Each bar? Jesus. 197 to 100,000, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Stage, yeah. The first one I picked up, I was holding like this, you know, close in, you know, holding it. And then when you get a few of them, you sort of like get hold of them, you throw them onto the shelf that we had. And if you drop one halfway, you're, ah, I'll get another one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly you lay like 100,000, you go, oh, well, I think I might just... <laughs> So much bullion coming up from the Edinburgh, the British and Russian officials are kept busy. A bureaucracy has grown up to account for each bar. The two governments couldn't help losing the gold the first time, but it would be embarrassing to mislay any again. sign for the 13 new bars and then we'll check and do a muster. See if we can pull it before 12 o'clock, Mr. Amira. The weather is beginning to break and the divers are tiring. By now, everyone is working against the clock to lift as much gold as possible before the salvage has to be called off. I believe this was 23 aboard on top of 401, which is uh, 425. 425, 425, so we're getting quite close now. Quite close. More than 90%? Well, I believe it is more than 90%, if that's what you're saying at this time in the morning with the snow coming down. But uh, quite a nice side, even though they are uh, a little bit on the dirty side, this lot. On October the 5th, the last bars recovered by the team are stacked in the Stefani Turn strong room. 431 have been salvaged. The planning, the effort, the money risked, all have paid off. Biggest winners are the Soviet government. For the least outlay, they get 14 and a half million pounds worth. But then it was their gold in the first place. The British government's share is seven and a quarter million, and the consortium have grossed nearly 18 million, which will be split according to the risks each member took. The rewards then have been spectacular. A prize to match the ambition of the project, the difficulties and dangers of the operation, and the courage of the divers. After six weeks at sea, the salvage team call it a day. The diving operation cannot continue in hurricane gales, and 34 bars have to be left in the wreck. But there remains one more thing to be done before they leave the scene of their triumph. We are gathered here to remember and to pay tribute to the officers and men of HMS Edinburgh who died on or shortly before that fateful day nearly 40 years ago when after a gallant fight HMS Edinburgh sank here beneath the Arctic waters of the Barents Sea. Right from the first moment of planning this operation this fact has been uppermost in all our minds and particularly so since the first diver descended nearly 800 feet and without any prompting and of his own accord paid two minutes silence. I think the, uh, the thing that brings it all to light is when, when we, we found when we were uh, clearing debris to get into the bomb room and found some hum human remains. It uh, kind of brought all the suffering back to light that uh, had gone on when the uh, ship was sunk and uh, it kind of, we were grumping and moaning about silly things like hot water and things like that, and uh, what, how we were uh, suffering doing the job, but uh, it wasn't any of the suffering compared to what these men went through when the ship sunk.
the ship sails into Murmansk to unload the Russian share. In six days' time, Keith Jessop and his international colleagues will arrive in Peterhead in Scotland, having completed the most successful salvage operation in the history of the sea. Thank you. Thank you. I will explain. This was the total cargo that was known to be on Edinburgh, and the recovery was 400. 500 feet below the North Sea requires a gambler's instincts. But when Richard Walker and Vic Geel died, were the odds unfairly stacked against them? And if so, why? A report by Brian Gould. I just couldn't understand that Richard was fated to die at that time. His life was not ready to end. Uh, it was almost as if they had the wrong man. And I, I remember telling someone, uh, I, I was sure uh, they had made a mistake, that it was someone else in the bell. In the North Sea, oil means money, but it also means danger. The rewards have been enormous for the country, the oil companies, and individuals. But the sea has exacted a price for yielding up its riches. A price sometimes paid in men's lives. Men like Vic Geel, 30-year-old American deep-sea diver, and his compatriot Richard Walker, who both died in the North Sea on the 8th of August, 1979. He's blown the whole house away and the mouth. Two years later, Richard Walker's widow, Jeannie, has still received no compensation. Wow, who's this? That's a pretty girl hippopotamus. At the time he died, she'd been left behind in California to look after their baby daughter. Marissa was then just 15 months old. He was very fond of Marissa. She was sort of the light of his life. He was surprised that he felt that way because I guess he hadn't seen himself as a family man until the time he met me. I think he shielded me from a lot of his feelings about his work because he didn't want me to believe it was dangerous. He didn't want me to worry. I know he enjoyed diving, but whether he enjoyed saturation diving, I don't know. Saturation divers work far out in the North Sea. They're offshore for weeks at a time. These are the men who actually work on the seabed. On duty, they can spend up to five weeks at pressures artificially created 
to match what they'll find hundreds of feet down. They spend up to half their time working. For the rest, there's nothing much to do but eat, read and sleep. In these cramped quarters on deck, there's both a physical and psychological strain. So every week spent in saturation earns them a week off work on shore. The pay is high too, up to 500 pounds a week, but the earning life of a diver is a short one. Most get out in their early 30s. In saturation, the air they breathe is a mixture of 2% oxygen and 98% helium. The gas saturates the body tissue. And at the end of a diving trip, it will take five days in saturation to bring their bodies back to normal. The helium has one other effect. It distorts the diver's voices. Their colleagues on deck control everything. The pressure, temperature and air supply inside the chamber and the diving bell. And you'll be taking off an old riser clamp and then we'll be putting on the new clamp. When their shift begins, the bell is locked on to the saturation chamber for the divers to enter. Inside, they put on their suits, which, like the bell itself, are heated by hot water. The bell, lowered on the main lift cable, is guided down on wires attached to a large piece of metal called the clump weight, another of whose functions is to hold the bell a few feet off the seabed. The hot water, air, power and communications are all supplied to the bell through a collection of tubes, the bell's umbilical. The main hazard of the North Sea is the cold. Even a brief interruption in the supply of hot water would be fatal. The divers take it in turns to work outside. Even this cramped bell will seem a welcome haven after four hours of exhausting work. 500 feet down, visibility almost nil, they lose their sense of colour and half their sense of touch. Richard Walker's feelings about this cold, lonely and claustrophobic world are revealed in the diary he always kept. They uh, did diving work around the clock, regardless of whether it was light or dark. And uh, the 7th of August, he wrote that he was on location at Thistlefield. The boat heaves a lot. Roger, that was one of the other men in saturation, says there are conger eels all over. We'll find out today. Poor topside management. I know that the only reason why he was still there was because of us, and that's, that's hard to live with. He says, I miss my little one. It really carves a hole right out of me. He says, I don't even know if I'm going to get out alive. The diving support vessel, the Wildrake, was in the first week of its work for the British National Oil Corporation in the Thistle Field. On board was Brian Masterson, boss of Infabco, the diving contractors. The deck foreman on the day shift was Dave Lane. John Brooke replaced him at midnight. All three were to be caught up in the 17-hour rescue attempt. At 11 p.m., the Wildrake sent two of its divers, Richard Walker and Vic Deal, down to check repairs previously done to an underwater installation. The bell would normally have been lowered on guide wires with the clump weight. But so that the bell could go over the side, instead of through the moon pool in the bottom of the ship, these were removed. In the early hours, Richard Walker, working outside the bell, saw it had slipped. He was instructed to return immediately. The main lift wire had broken away. A crucial pin had fallen out. The BNOC representative on board the Wildrake kept a diving log. It records the accident, and he notes the time, 2.45 a.m. Marissa and I were leaving to go shopping one day, and came out of the house. I was helping her down the steps. She was just you know, walking, but not very confidently. And uh, a man drove up who I knew, worked for the company. He came up to me and said, there's been an accident. <laughs> Said not to worry that uh, Richard was fine and it would just be a matter of time before they raised the bell to the surface because what had happened was the cable had snapped, I believe he said. Uh, 
and they hadn't struck the bottom hard. They were working close to the bottom, so not to worry. It was just a matter of time. There was no immediate problem. Hot water, air, and communications were still being supplied through the umbilical. But it hadn't been approved as a means of lifting the bell, so the attempt then made to do so turned a difficulty into a crisis. Once the weight had been transferred totally, to the umbilical, it, it was found that the umbilical um, tended to flatten out because it was not braided in any way. It was just um, loomed together and taped at, I think, approximately sort of 18 inch two foot intervals. And as we attempted to lift the bell with the umbilical, the bell, A, jammed down the side of the, the two plates on the side, and it was fairly obvious that it was stretching. And, there was no way the bell was going to be lifted with this particular method. So they then tried to bypass the winch and use the ship's crane to lift the bell on the umbilical. Did that work? No, it didn't, because again, uh, because of this lack of strength in the umbilical, uh, when the strength was taken over this knot, the knot just literally chewed into the umbilical and was obviously doing far more damage than had been done previously. One by one, the bell's life support systems were ruptured. At that point, the bell was lowered, or fell, no one is sure which, to the seabed. What little was left of the umbilical was eventually cut, to avoid obstructing other efforts to raise the bell. Do you think when the bell fell back at that point, was that a crucial moment in the rescue attempt? I believe so. I believe it... Um, I believe for the two men inside, that was probably the, the last they knew of what was happening. They still had no news. And, uh, and I could see that he was beginning to be very concerned. And I said, but why are you worried? Because if you've just dropped it, what could be wrong with them? They still have their hot water, they have their air. And he said, no, they don't. That they had cut those lines. They had broken. And then he said it was just a matter of time that we just had to hope. Even with the main lift wire gone and hot water and air supplies cut off, there was still a third emergency lifting system. The divers themselves could release drop weights, which would allow the bell to rise through its own buoyancy. But the drop weights had been tied on from the outside, and this, coupled with the removal of the clump weight, left the divers caught in a cruel trap. It was standard procedure um, with companies to actually lash off as a secondary uh, safety measure to actually lash the drop weights onto the bell. So they had a quick release system inside, but to make sure that this quick, quick release system did not um, operate without um, uh, the intention of the divers inside, uh, a diver had to go out initially to cut off the, the nylon lashings. But of course, that's all well and good if the diver can actually get outside. But I, I believe in this situation, it was fairly impossible for the diver to find room between the seabed and the base of the trunking. The bell ordinarily would have sat on top of the clump weight, allowing the divers to get in and out in the event that the, they should lose their main lift. In this case, it meant that the bell sat on the seabed and the bottom of the bell door was flush with the seabed itself and they couldn't get out to uh, release their own drop weights or to effect um, um, a wet, wet transfer to another bell. Shortly after 3 a.m., the Steno Welder, another vessel working for BNOC nearby, was called in to help since the Wildrake couldn't lift the bell unaided. Alan Mellor was the captain. For 17 hours, he kept his ship above the Wildrake Bell, a feat of seamanship praised at the subsequent inquiry. It was 6 a.m. before the Stenner welder was ready to dive. It took their divers two more hours to locate the bell, because its homing device had been removed just before the fateful dive. The bell located, the Wildrake lowered its crane wire. The Stenner welder divers struggled for a further two hours to attach the wire to the bell. The Stenner welder wanted to lift the bell themselves, since they were directly above it, but they weren't permitted to do so. What no one knew was that the bell had become caught on the underwater structure. Captain Alan Mella recalls what happened. Well, it was a total farce. It was a total farce. It assumed an angle of 45 degrees, 
which we saw, I mean, I was on the bridge wing on the control of the ship. We saw the crane wire being taken up, assume an angle of 45 degrees. I pointed out to the BNSC representative on board our ship who was doing the bridge liaison that um, there is no way they could do a safe lift at 45 degrees. The BNOC representative passed my request across to Mr. Masterson and he, his answer to that was heave on everything, heave on everything. That leaves us to say the burr ends come up. So the fourth rescue attempt had failed. Nine agonizing hours elapsed before the Stenner welder divers could reconnect the crane wire to the bell. It was brought to the surface at 7.45 p.m. Then they called again and said the bell was coming on board and they would call us right back with the condition of my husband. It must have been an hour and a half before they called us back. And I heard what he said, and I heard what he asked, and I knew what they told him. But I still ask him when he came out, he's okay. That, no. He said he was dead. And uh, all I remember was screaming and the walls falling in. How did the people involved in the rescue attempt feel at that moment? Sick. I felt very, very sick. I felt very bitter. I felt very bitter. Because I felt, I felt very, very strongly, and I felt more strongly afterwards, obviously, that if we'd have been allowed to do what we wanted to do, them two men would have been alive today. When they eventually got the bell up, did you personally have any hopes at that stage? Not really. I don't think any of us really did. And when we finally got the bell on the deck, we, well, we lifted it out of the water. One of the men was actually lying inside one of the large portholes, and it was a pretty horrific sight, and oh, was, we all felt pretty sick. We all realised it was no chance. It would have made life a lot easier if we'd have been allowed to do what we wanted to do, and that, as I said, was to attach a line to the top of the stricken bell and then run a, a davit line down it, and then we could lift the bell. Then we would have had the bell. We weren't allowed to do this. But your theory was never been put to the test. How do you know it would have worked? It's worked since. I mean, si si since this particular incident, there's been a couple more incidents in the North Sea where they've done similar things, where they've lifted the bell and done a wet transfer. The accident shocked and saddened Aberdeen, and especially the dead divers' friends, many of them friends of Jeannie as well. I began to ask questions about who decided what, who did what who was responsible for doing various things. The man in charge of the rescue, an engineer rather than seaman or diver, was Brian Masterson, boss of Infabco Diving Services. Sixteen months later, it was his company that faced criminal charges for serious breaches of the diving regulations. Failure to obtain the necessary approvals for saturation diving, failure to ensure that the diving equipment was in safe and proper order. All the evidence on these points was presented at the four-day trial, but the key to its outcome lay here in Jersey. Brian Masterson had set up a company called Offshore Coordinators, a straightforward tax avoidance device. It enabled Infabco to plead that they were technically not the employers of the divers. The loophole has since been plugged, but it allowed Brian Masterson to walk out of court, his company acquitted. The company, and particularly Brian Masterson, didn't escape so lightly at the fatal accident inquiry held in Aberdeen. The sheriff's task was to report on the causes of the accident rather than attribute blame. But in his judgment published last month, the sheriff found that rescue equipment wasn't properly tested. Diving equipment was faulty. Masterson made errors of judgment. His evidence in some respects was so obviously false that if a fatal accident inquiry were not a serious process, it would have been laughable. Jeannie Walker recognised that the sheriff's strictures hurt Brian Masterson's reputation, but not much else. She was determined to raise that with Aberdeen's Procurator Fiscal. Uh, I have first a couple of questions about the findings. I understand that the sheriff found that uh, Brian Masterson was not telling the truth. 
Yes, something, yes, he made a, a comment to that effect that, uh, what did he say, if it hadn't been such a serious matter, his evidence would be laughable. Laughable, mm. okay. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know what the Scottish laws are about this, but I was hoping that, uh, this would enable you to bring perjury charges against Mr. Masterson, maybe on the basis of this evidence and maybe on the basis of similar evidence that he gave at the criminal trial. Uh -huh. Well, we'll have to consider that now. Uh, we examine the evidence once again and see okay. whether uh, criminal proceedings are warranted. The fiscal has confirmed to us that no further proceedings are contemplated. That's a decision that Jeannie will find disappointing. Yes, but surely they were working for someone. <laughs> I have my personal opinion about yeah. who they were working for, which I think is, is uh, soundly based, but uh, my interest is in seeing that these people be brought to trial. So a clear disregard of safety standards has so far gone unpunished. The overall responsibility for North Sea oil safety rests with the Department of Energy. They've brought in new safety regulations to plug the gaps revealed by the Infabco accident. But it's the oil companies who actually extract the oil and who are responsible for operational safety. In this case, the operators were BNOC. We asked BNOC if, since the accident, they'd done anything to improve supervision of their contractors' safety standards. But they wished to make no comment. The safety buck stops with small firms like Infabco. Their lucrative contracts to run day-to-day -day operations mean intense competition. Corners may be cut. The sheriff, in his report following the fatal accident inquiry, said... The diving contractors were more concerned with speed than with safety. And in particular... The diving operations were commenced without first having established that the means of recovery would be effective. The decision to carry on diving without the clump weight was a serious error which made a material contribution to the deaths. Brian Masterson was certainly a young man in a hurry. He'd done work for BNOC as an engineer. Linking up with Infabco Diving Services in 1978, he launched the new company into the big league with a major BNOC contract. That was a contract to set up a diving system on the Gulnare. Like this, a semi-submersible rig. The contract proved to be so lucrative that it was described by a then director of Infabco as a once-in-a-lifetime deal. At the time they made their bid, the new company had an expert team of divers, highly regarded by Joe Singletary, then the BNOC offshore construction manager. But Infabco had something else going for them as well. In Joe Singletary's offices in Aberdeen for a pre-bid meeting over the weekend, they found out the details of rival bids. After submitting the lowest bid, they were awarded the contract on the following day. We telephoned Joe Singletary, who has since left BNOC, in Curaçao to ask him about these matters. In London. Do you remember in June 1978, when Infabco Diving Services was trying to get its first contract, and indeed obtained a contract on the Gulnare, can you remember the circumstances of that contract being obtained? Yeah, of course I remembered. It was investigated about three different times by the police over there, so it's all just a matter of record. That's right, and also investigated by BNOC, I believe. We invited him to recall the meeting at which we believe bid details were seen by Infabco. It was a meeting at w which was attended by four people at least from Infabco. I can name them for you if you wish. And the telex... Talking about a bunch of crap like that that's been pulsed over, it's been investigated by the police, all a matter of record. And I start, uh, you start trying to ask me if I remember something, uh, the second step in Infabco's success story was another important BNOC contract, this time with the Wildrake, the vessel involved in the fatal dive. In the spring of 1979, the Wildrake was being built and fitted out here in Stavanger. A number of diving firms expressed interest in the new ship, with a view to a forthcoming contract to repair an underwater installation for BNOC. But by the end of May, the Norwegian owners had reached agreement on the Wildrake's first charter with a new hirer in Fabco Diving Services. The negotiations were carried out in Stavanger by Bob Lloyd, then the Infabco general manager. I believe we had an exclusive right to the Wildrake. A legally binding right. No other sort would be much use to you. An agreement. 
is what I said, and that's what I believed, that we had an agreement. Whether that was in the form at that time of the Charter Party, or whether it was in the form of an agreement between the two parties, I don't know. Were you the only company that had the will, Drake? I don't know. I would hope so, because we thought we had an exclusive right, as you previously said. That exclusive right turned out to be a trump card when a BNOC telex inviting tenders for the new contract was issued on the 1st of June. The vessel which most closely matched the specifications was the Wildrake, though Joe Singletary says that several ships could have undertaken the work. However, it was clear that a firm offering the Wildrake had the best chance, and Fabco had obtained their exclusive right to the vessel a week before the BNOC telex was issued. At the time of the accident, Infadco was trying to win a third important BNOC contract. Well, it was the daily conversation on board the vessel. You know, had anybody heard any news about the contract being renewed? Everybody was very concerned because obviously it meant employment for, for some time to come for quite a number of people. As it was, the accident almost certainly cost Brian Masterson the contract. But that isn't the end of the story for Jeannie Walker. That's it. Two and a half years after her husband's death, she job? hasn't received a penny in compensation. That's something she wanted to discuss with her Aberdeen good. solicitor, Reg Christie. Got here. You have brought an action in America. I'm not sure what stage that action's at now. Well, we attempted to bring an action, but the uh, Infabico failed to come to court, and we got a default judgment. Yes. The situation. But Infabco have no American assets. And since Jeannie doesn't qualify for British legal aid, it would cost her thousands of pounds she doesn't have to pursue her claim here. We thought this should be raised with Brian Masterson personally. Good morning, Mr. Masterson. Brian Gould's my name from Thames Television. I wondered if you could tell me how you're getting on with your compensation claim. Do you mind? Uh, I, I just do, want to, I do yes. mind very much. I'll just make yes. a phone call. Yes, by all means. Thank you. But, Thank you very yes. much. Yes, but would you not please tell us how you're getting on with the claim by the widow? Um, Excuse me, I'll just take one time. Certainly, yes. Uh, will, will you speak to us after that? The Aberdeen oil industry, and particularly the diving contractors, tend to close ranks when things go wrong. They're sensitive about the industry's reputation, and people who talk out of turn aren't looked on with favor. That hasn't made Jeannie Walker's task any easier. I seriously question at this point whether I will ever really know what happened to my husband or why. A few people have been very helpful and very kind. Uh, many people have been very kind, but very much afraid. For Jeannie, the truth about Richard's death may be all she can now hope to salvage. That looks like the waves at home, doesn't it? Except it's cold. Tomorrow.